I just found Steve Shine King. Hey, congratulations, Steve. A busy, a busy week for you. Yeah, it was a good week. Thank it, you very much. It's yes. great to be here. This is like the uh, third time, right? Third time, yeah. It's been a good run of last few years. Yeah, right. very much. I, I think it's three out of the last four years you've been on the list. Yes. That's yeah. right. Why do you think uh, your type of book is so appealing to the, the judges and the different judges every year? Different. Yeah, so I don't think there's, a, there's one thing. I think it's almost like a perfect storm kind of a situation where I've been really lucky because I just think nonfiction has really, is having a good moment. And I hope it's more than a moment. I think it's more of a beginning of, of an expansion. It's not just health food anymore. That's really what it is. And I came along at the right time with these, I hope, narrative plot-driven, exciting to read stories that, that teachers and educators and parents realize, hey, I want my kids to know this, and they actually might like it, which is a great thing. And there are a lot of authors doing this right now, so I feel like we're kind of creating a lot of momentum for nonfiction, and I've been able to be a part of that. And so, just to remind people, the first time it was for Bomb, right? Yeah, I just happened to have the books with me. Uh, yeah, right yeah. Here. I what, don't know why. Yes. Yeah, this one right the here. They're all nonfiction. And right. this one's about the making of the bomb and the espionage. It's really kind of a spy story. I was very inspired by spy novels that I love to read. And I did that format, but as a young adult nonfiction book about basically the making of the bomb and the stealing of the bomb by Soviet spies. And then the second time was for? The second time was for the Port Chicago 50. Also a World War II story, but really more of a civil rights story about some young, very young sailors, many of them 17, 18 years old, who stood up against segregation in the Navy during World War II and were charged with mutiny for it. So the most serious crime. They were told they would be shot if they didn't back down, and they didn't back down. And, and now, most dangerous, and that's about? That is a story from the Vietnam War, kind of a Cold War political thriller about this character, Daniel Ellsberg, this guy who I, who I love because some people think to this day that he's a hero and some a traitor. And I love a character like that. Um, he was the one who, he wouldn't use the word stole, but he acquired, shall we say, these top secret papers that exposed all the lies the government had told about the Vietnam War and, and leaked them to the New York Times. And it led to a, just a huge firestorm, very similar to what happened to Edward Snowden recently. Um, but this one was even bigger in the 70s. It led directly to... Well, to Nixon going quite mad and directly to Watergate and a lot of other things. A very exciting story. Now, now Steve, I know from uh, talking to you in the past that you, when you're doing your research, you like collect things. So did you, did you collect, what have you collected from uh, Daniel Ellsberg? Massive piles of documents. There's too much. There's a such thing as being too much information available. And when you have such a contemporary source, Daniel is still around and I've talked to him many times and interviewed him. So that's one great source that I've never, you can't interview Benedict Arnold or Robert Oppenheimer. So, I mean, it's just amazing to have someone who's still around who I can call. His wife, Patricia Ellsberg, is the main character in the story. She was fantastic. She even told me, I said, I want to know more about your early relationship with, with Daniel and, and how you influenced him. And she said, well, I'll tell you about, you know, what it was like with him, but it's probably not going to be appropriate for younger readers. But here goes, and she told me some outrageous stories, some of which made it, some which did not. Um, so that kind of stuff, which is beyond anything you could find in a library or archive. I have all that stuff too, but the personal hands-on stuff is amazing. Great. And so what are you uh, working on now? A total change of pace, which really had to be from such a serious story to a sports story. It's, it has a serious heart to it because of where it takes place, a place called the Carlisle Indian School which was in the late 1800s and early 1900s a boarding school for Indian kids off of reservations and the army had basically decided we were going to take these kids and teach them to be quote Americans as if they weren't Americans um, and against all odds these kids formed a football team at a time when Princeton, Harvard, Yale, the, the elite of the elite uh, dominated football and would not let anyone touch them they won all their games and these kids from this tiny school uh, that nobody paid any attention to or respected said, you know what, we're going to take on Princeton and Yale and Harvard, and everyone laughed at them. So it's this great underdog sports story about the early days of football, which was much more violent, much more violent, if you can imagine, than it is now. And these undersized kids who took on the system and, and won. So was this a story you knew? A little bit. Jim Thorpe, who a lot of people think is one of the greatest athlete of the 20th century, was one of the players at Carlisle. So he becomes, of course, a main character in my story, following him from his reservation in Oklahoma 
running away from every school they tried to send him to until he shows up at Carlisle as a last resort and find sports as his salvation. Congratulations and thanks for chatting with us. Yeah, thanks, it's been really fun. Thanks, Rocco.